Um, hi everyone, thank you for tuning in and thank you for inviting me to be part of this wonderful series of talks with Talking Books. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my book, This is How the Earth Must See Itself, and then to talk about manual editions, which is the publishing platform that I've established to publish my own handmade books. So my work explores the tensions between scientific knowledge systems and the walked experience of the landscape. So all of the projects that I make start from walking, going out into the landscape and seeing things that make me curious and that I want to investigate further. And I try to travel in a, as low impact way as possible. So taking the train, walking on foot and carrying my own shelter wherever I possibly can. And I do a lot of research about these things that I'm curious about, um, reading a lot about scientific um, phenomena, a lot about geology, um, looking at maps, and also trying to distill down the things that I'm interested in through mind mapping, sketchbooking, and doing diagrams and drawings that help me to understand what I'm, what I'm investigating. And I work very much in a physical space. So I print out my images on different types of paper. Um, I investigate how the tactility of, and colours of those paper influence how I'm experiencing or communicating the things that I'm looking at. And from very early on in the stage of a project, I make book dummies. So um, thinking about how I'm sequencing and how I can use the medium of the book to tell the story of, of what I'm looking at. And in the top corner, these are some of the book dummies that I've made for this book, which I'm going to be talking about. So there's quite a lot of iterations of tests um, of the physical object of the book. So this is how the Earth must be itself, or what with natural features. Um, I released as a, a limited edition of 58 books, which are all handmade. Um, in May um, of this year, so just a couple of months ago. And this project started from my walking of the south coast of England, which is somewhere I've been walking for more than 20 years. And I realised um, in 2019 that I had, that I was building this kind of archive of my relationship with this south coast of England. So I started to look at the photographs that I had been taking on these walks, which were never meant to be a project, but somehow they started to build up um, a dialogue with this coastline and why I keep being drawn back to walk it. So the coastline itself is about 1100 miles long and I haven't walked the whole of this coastline, but I've walked many sections um, over the course of the years, um, sometimes as day trips from London, which is where I live, and sometimes as multi-day walks where I would catch the train out to the coastline, walk a section over several days, carrying my tent, um, and then travel back. So, and some of it um, through holidays with family and friends. So there's been many different experiences of walking um, sections of the path. Um, and something I became very interested in as I was starting to look at this archive and think about my relationship with this coastline was the importance of the map in how I plan my routes and how I experience the landscape when I'm actually walking. So I use the Ordnance Survey physical paper maps um, as I'm walking. And I started to look at the origin of these maps and how in the early, in the kind of 17, 1800s, these maps very much resembled the landscape that they depicted. And they were almost like landscape paintings. Um, and with these early maps, you didn't really need symbols to understand them because they so closely represented the landscape that you would see. But over time, the language that was used in these maps um, became very abstracted from the natural world. And so, these systems of symbols evolved to help us to understand their language um, of these maps. 
And in the 1950s, the Ordnance Survey um, made an even further kind of departure from the landscape where they started to look at aerial photographs of the land and to think about how they would draw a map based on these photographs. So very much taking the symbols for the, the drawings from photographs themselves. And this really interested me because I'm using the maps to make photographs, but then the maps themselves are coming from photographs. So there ended up being this kind of cyclic relationship between drawing and photographs, which I, I started to explore in the work. So I was particularly interested in the rock features um, within this map, the map symbols, as they represent so much of the landscape um, that we experience, especially along this coastline, which is um, predominantly depicted by the rock features. So I began to look into the origin of these five rock symbols within the map and to look at the rules which determined how, when the surveyors went out into the landscape and walked this coastline the same way that I was, how did they choose how to represent what they were seeing in these line drawings? And some of the rules that they followed were things like, is the rock larger than 256 millimeter or not? Um, was the rock feature almost vertical? Was it loose? Um, so I began to think, would I be able to follow these rules um, if I had to make a map? Um, and what would that look like? Um, so this developed into a kind of framework for my, my archive and how I would start to organize it into a project. And working very much from these early stage with my physical photographs. So I print everything out at six by four and I, I start to play with it um, within the space where I work testing folding and paper and playing with things and also putting up reference images of things that might be of interest. And so I started to um, organize my images according to these four, these five um, rock features and to pair them. And I was really interested how through the pairing and sequencing of the images, I would start to see things in the images that I wouldn't have without the pairings or the juxtapositions. So it became very much about pairing and sequencing and grouping and how they started to build up um, a narrative around these, these individual rock features. And when I first started uh, the project, I was collecting things as I was walking. So taking away objects that I found interesting and photographing them in my studio space um, when I got back. But as the Pred Bowl decided that um, I didn't really want to be taking things, um, I wanted to be leaving no trace. So I started to photograph objects in situ. So finding things and then finding a backdrop that I could photograph them against. Um, and that evolved as the project went on. And through the research that I was doing, um, I did a workshop um, with the Ordnance Survey Organization and their cartography team. And they were able to help me with the research and point out books and archives that I should investigate as, as part of the project. And that led me to discover this archive of um, fossils, which the Ordnance Survey team, when they were mapping the coastline, they had accumulated all of these samples um, of fossils. And later these, this collection had been drawn and this archive of drawings had been created. And it, it fascinated me that I had these, very, these five very simple symbols, but yet there was infinite variety in the rocks that they were finding. So I wanted to bring this archive into the work um, and into the book. And something which helped me with how to do that was going back to the, the map drawing and the cartography, um, the, the rock features within the early Ordnance Survey maps were referred to as ornament um, because of their quite flamboyant style of drawing within the maps themselves. So I was interested in looking at the definition of ornament as something which often embellishes or makes something more beautiful but has no function. Um, and this 
quite contradicts the fact that rocks are the structure of the earth that we inhabit and they are quite fundamental in terms of the, the makeup of, of where we live. Um, so I began to play with this idea of ornament um, and to look at how ornaments um, kind of or archaeological finds have been depicted in photographs or in drawings and how could I bring this idea more fully into the work. So I began to appropriate this archive um, and to take drawings from them um, and bring them into the pairings of my book. And, and this was also a way of building on this relationship between drawing and photography, which has interested me early on in my research. And something I'm also very much exploring in the work is scale um, and how scale helps us to understand images. Um, so often in, in science or, or in geology, there is something in the photograph which helps you to understand scale. It might be a ruler or a paperclip or a pen that helps you to understand the scale of the rock that you're looking at. And by omitting that from the photograph, um, how we lose that sense of scale. Um, and I question whether it's even important to understand it, especially when you take these images out of a scientific context. So as I started to develop the ideas for the book, I wanted this ordnance survey map, um, the physical properties of this map to be translated into the physical object of the book. So you can see here the ordnance survey map, which um, I was using to plan and um, carry out my walks. And then this is the book and the box for the book, which are the same size and format. And I wanted to capture some of the physical experience of kind of unfolding the book and folding things out that are very um, specific to the experience of an ordnance survey map um, and very familiar to anyone who's kind of used them. So I developed the structure of the book into five chapters and each of those chapters follows one of these rock symbols, um, which was represented in, in the, the map. And then I have sequenced my archive into these categories following the strange rules that the surveyors would have used to, to represent the landscape. So each of these chapters has a series of pairings of photographs and archival drawings, um, and then is wrapped by one of these kind of map images, which plays with plays further with scale. And in the center of each of those chapters is a kind of a sample insert, which is printed on recycled paper, which is made from post-consumer waste. Um, and part of my reason for doing that was to play on the idea that how we live now and the things that we create will end up in, in the geological record in the future. Um, and how could I bring in that future um, rock information into the, the physical object of the book? And something that I thought a lot about was whether I should reveal these rock symbols within the book, um, and if so, how I would do it. And I decided to hide the, the symbols from the map um, behind these these central inserts into each of the chapter. So as you look through the book, you would discover these symbols um, within the center of each of those chapters. And something I really enjoy about working with books is, is the fact that you can include a lot of different types of information within the pages. So I can include photographs, but also drawings and text, and all of these elements can work together to build up the, the narrative of the project. So as part of this project, I worked with the Ordnance Survey's open source data to extract the rock information layers from their maps and then to use these rock layers to create my own maps for the book. So the image that you can see in the top here with the map, those are the rock layers um, which represent um, the rock features on the coastline of, of England. 
Um, and then I also wanted to introduce some more participatory parts um, to the book, which was also relating to the, the research and that I'd done into map manuals and um, kind of geology books, where they often give you um, tools so that you can go out and do your own investigation and field work. So I also wanted to include that as a kind of way of bringing people in into the book um, and kind of also hinting at the fact it's not finished. Um, I'll continue to walk the coastline and continue to make images even after the project is, is complete. And quite late in the process, I decided that I wanted to develop um, a box for the book um, to further amplify this idea of kind of folding and, and um, opening up and also relate to kind of sample packets that you would make as part of field work to bring back samples. So I developed this um, phase book, which kind of encloses and, and protects the book itself. And um, as I work in such a kind of physical tactile way, I naturally hand make all of my books. So this book is released as an edition of 58 handmade books, all of which I make myself from the flap printed sheets. So all of the folding, all of the cutting and all of the binding I'm doing myself. And I self published my first book before this book, which was called Born of the Purest Parents. And it was a, a project about the landscape and culture of salt. Um, and this experience um, convinced me that I should continue to self-publish my books. But I wanted to um, establish more of a framework for doing that. So as part of releasing this book, I established Manual Editions, which is a small publishing imprint that I can release my handmade books under. And a couple of the things which I wanted to develop as part of this um, publishing platform was a transparency around the way that we make things. Um, so for each of the books that I publish, I include a page on the website where you can see all of the materials and processes that we use to make the book. So it tells you all of the different paper types, um, where it was printed, um, and how I'm dealing with things like waste and packaging. And far from saying that this that I'm doing something perfect, it's far from that. It's more like being transparent about the way that I'm doing things and also um, committing to improve on that each time I publish another book. So this is where I was for this book and the next one, I hope that I can be more, even more responsible with the way that I make it. Um, and something else which I'm doing with this platform is creating an artist book library. So each of the books that I publish are available as a library book that can be borrowed for a small fee. So um, I've, I think that there's a gap between kind of looking at a book in a bookshop or a book fair and then making the commitment to own a book. Um, not all of us have endless money and endless bookshelf space. So if you wanted to spend a week with the book, um, you can, you can borrow it. Um, and yeah, it's been great to see people um, kind of using this initiative and actually signing up to borrow the books. Um, and something else which I am exploring at the moment is sustainable publishing network. So connecting with other people who are making books um, and interested in sharing knowledge and ideas around sustainable publishing. So we've been having some really interesting conversations over the last couple of months with a group of publishers and photographers about how we share knowledge and create a dialogue about um, kind of making an environmentally conscious way. And I was just going to finish on showing some installation um, images of the book. So this is an exhibition that I was part of in at Format Festival in England. And I used the proof copy of the book as part of the exhibition. So I deconstructed the book um, and exhibited it on the walls um, in the gallery space so that people could interact with and and look at the individual parts of the book um, and also a way of reusing a proof copy, which I had no purpose for. 
and that's the end. So thank you very much. Thank you, Damsin. Uh, you can clap. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, that was uh, the people here live. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, don't think, uh, is there any questions? Okay, uh, yeah, <laughs> usual. Uh, there's not many questions, and uh, we're since we're running a little bit late because of the uh, delay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for being uh, with us this morning. The talk will be online anyways, so people can watch it at any time. And yeah, uh, I guess Miriam will be in touch with you uh, to say thanks as well on the email. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed. And sorry for the delay at the beginning. No worries at all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Cool.